<clears throat> when I was a kid, I was very uncomfortable with the idea of using things when I didn't know how they worked. First of all, if I didn't know what was going on inside of them, I could never predict when they might suddenly screw up. I thought this could be really dangerous. For example, a machine might blow up or radiation might cause your stomach to start digesting your body, probably because my mom watched the headlines with bated breath, waiting to report new studies suggesting with persuasive evidence that TV makes your kids ugly. It didn't help that when I was about six, a guy in my neighborhood put a pipe bomb in his mom's car, which blew up when she started the engine. There was another lurking reason I wanted to know how everything I relied on worked. I had a sneaking suspicion that civilization was about to collapse, and I wanted to be able to rebuild from scratch any invention I found particularly useful. I had elaborate plans based on this idea. I used to lie in bed for hours going through Richard's scary books. You know, the ones with the really chaotic illustrations of animals driving hot dog mobiles and watermelon trucks on the highway, with lots of accidents where the contents of the vehicles were strewn provocatively across the road. I made detailed mental lists of all the items my friends and I would scrounge and then planned our escape to the treehouse in which we lived. When I got older, I made some real friends and stopped masturbating to kids' books as much. And besides taking apart my parents' first cell phone and the motor from the vacuum cleaner, both of which made no sense to me beyond concluding that the motor was some kind of electromagnet, I stopped caring about how things worked. It turns out that all human inventions, from cars and computers to civilization itself, were more stable than I thought they were and wanted them to be when I was a kid. When I was younger, I wasn't as attached to the world. I didn't trust that when something worked once, it would necessarily work again the next time. I would watch and read things over and over and try certain experiments, like trying to ride my bike with the handlebars turned completely around, many times. I wasn't convinced that gravity was always paying attention to what I was doing, and thought if I was really sneaky, I might be able to get around it. A few weeks ago, I found this old diary I attempted to keep for about 10 years that has a total of about 10 entries in it. Folded up and carefully hidden behind the front end paper was a secret recipe sheet on which I spent an intense afternoon trying to invent a new color. All the new colors, which I also named, were vague-looking scribbles of the colors that already existed in my crayon box. <laughs> when I started getting used to the world, I accepted its invasive presence in my life. I forgot that at least the parts of it that are based in human invention are our own fault, and I even got attached to aspects of it and comforted by the way they seethe on my kitchen counter oops, and lurk in the corners of my bedroom. I'm not trying to glorify my childhood. If it meant so much to me, I wouldn't have left it behind. The cutesy things I remember are only evidence of how uninformed I was, which isn't what I wanted it to be, wanted to be even then, because reality isn't cute. For example, when I was a kid, I really liked my sister's now ex-husband. I thought he was handsome, funny, charming. He bought me ice cream and took me fishing. Then I found out he was beating my sister in front of her kids. And that's what the world is doing to us from the time we're small and think it's charming to the time we're old and comforted by its abuse. I'm not convinced we can do anything to change this. We cling to the idea that we can because otherwise our lives have no meaning outside of sheer physical survival. But I think many of our actions unwittingly work to further our abuse. I think a more realistic goal is to try to prevent yourself from believing in lies. Don't just accept things. Don't be misled. For me, this means asking the same kinds of questions I did when I was a kid, but this time consciously trying to remove as much of the fantasy as possible. People who, people who think they are changing things are prone to delusions of grandeur. People who realize they are weak and beaten to do this just want to survive with the most dignity and honesty they can. I want to ask why people choose to do things they don't want to do. I want to ask what people think their actions mean and why they think they matter to anyone else. I want to ask what people think the best possible world would look like. And I want to understand why the things we have now work and how they might break. How do we so easily accept the role in our lives of things we don't even understand? We voluntarily include new things, trusting that they only do what they say on the box and that their presence is in our best interest, even though each new object is literally a drain on our own lives and resources. We accept the mysterious new properties of many inventions without ever questioning how they do what they do. I'm not suggesting that these kinds of questions are subversive or that they'll change anything, but learning to ask these kinds of questions about everything may help prevent you from taking part in your own abuse. Microwave ovens are a good example. They're a common kitchen appliance. Lots of people have them. They also have a plethora of strange properties. They heat things without getting hot. They make some things explode. They melt certain synthetic materials. They spark if you put a fork in them. But people generally accept that these are just the rules that govern microwave usage and don't worry too much about what the melting, sparking radiation box in their kitchen is actually doing. So I'll tell you. Microwave ovens contain a device called a magnetron, which generates microwave radiation. The, microwave tra the microwaves travel through a channel known as a waveguide into the chamber where we place our food. Microwaves are a type of electromagnetic radiation, which means they travel at the speed of light in the form of a wave. They also reflect off of metal surfaces, which is why the whole microwave oven is made of metal, so the microwaves don't escape, because they can have some unpleasant, unpleasant effects on your body, and why metal objects in the microwave spark. As the microwaves bounce off the metal walls in the oven, they interfere with each other and form a standing wave. This is a wave that doesn't appear to be moving, just oscillating up and down, with nodes in between wave peaks that don't move. These nodes are cold spots in the oven. Microwave ovens make food warm through a process called dielectric heating, in which polar molecules in a substance rotate to align themselves with an oscillating electric field. Since temperature is actually the average kinetic energy, the energy of movement, of atoms and molecules in a substance, agitating polar molecules in this way causes them to heat up. 
With time, they transfer this heat to surrounding molecules. Water is an example of a strongly polar molecule, and microwaves are very effective at heating water and substances containing a lot of it. They are less effective at heating fats and sugars because they are less polar than water, and ice is also the harder to heat with microwaves because the water molecules are held in a crystal lattice structure that makes them less inclined to rotate. sexuality makes me question people's motives in going anywhere or doing anything. All space is sexualized, and despite my discomfort, I'm unable to over overcome even my own sexualization. I feel trapped by desire, unsure if I want to have sex or if culture has told me I should want it. And the way spaces define our sexuality makes sex explicitly tied to culture. Am I choosing to do things, expressing the intention of being radical, and really I'm trying to make myself a more appealing sex object to those I find sexually attractive? All our social activities are structured around creating the opportunity for sexual encounter. We stumble around dance parties, potlucks, and shows in a half-aroused stupor, where our most fruitful action is also the most titillating, and we feign social consciousness through the activism we wear like a revealing garment. We declare that our sex is an act of dissent, to the detriment of both our sex and our descent. Pursuing sex based on what seems to oppose the mainstream forces you onto a path running parallel to the dominant culture, with road signs marked in a different but complementary color. We have to be careful not to ascribe unwarranted significance to our daily actions. We can give personal meanings to our activities as we wish, but we can't live as if our peculiarities are chipping away at a system designed to thrive on marketing to so-called individuals. There are businesses that whose target market is people who don't want to be marketed to. Sex is sex. I don't want mine to be perverted by rebellion any more than oppression. Rebellion acknowledges the presence of its oppressor. I don't want to dilute myself by accepting the tenets of any culture, even subculture. I am cultured only because I can't help it, and it is a tumor I am always mutilating myself in attempts to remove. Culture burdens my life by overstuffing it with meanings and definitions. We let culture define our space and space define our actions. These definitions don't give our actions significance, only restrict their impact. Even if you have a lot of sex, for example, when your sex is defined by culture, you will always feel repressed. Definitions set limits on desire. This is true no matter what the culture is. If your challenge to dominant culture is some other incarnation of culture, dominant culture knows how to handle you, incorporation. Capitalism thrives on entrepreneurs. I can only free my actions, including sex, if I can shave off their cultural definitions. Culture disfigures us and forces us to mask our intentions, even to ourselves. Okay, I have two more. <clears throat> Science is a standardized process of creating models. People should value these models only to the extent that they tell us something useful about the world. For example, our model of the human heart is valuable only if it works well enough that we can make a functional artificial heart. The ultimate goal of these models is different depending on whether you believe that the universe contains absolute uh, or objective truths that we may someday realize. If you do believe this, then scientists are constantly revising their models to make them closer to the real truth at the heart of all things. If you do not, then they're working to discover cases where their current models do not give us useful information, cases where their current models do not work, and then developing new models that do work by predicting events in the real world or by enabling us to invent new devices and processes. Scientific models become the stories that those who value and believe in them tell themselves to explain their everyday world. They are distinguished from the stories of pseudosciences, including those of religion, in that they provide evidence of their usefulness via reputable experiments.